thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, so since my co-authors weren't in the room a minute ago, I just wanted to put up their pictures so you could see, uh, see them and shame them in person. Um, all right, so um, hopefully most of you are familiar with this family. Um, if not, it's gonna be a long talk for some of you. Um, all right, so you may not know that The Simpsons' appearance has actually changed a lot over the years. Uh, initially, they were uh, pretty hideous. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of similarly, uh, like the, the iPhone in my pocket uh, is much sleeker and nicer and purple and, and everything. It has lots of great, uh, it's super powerful. Um, and here's the iPhone of the day, right? So this is the Apple One, one megahertz, uh, eight bit processor, pretty limited, right? So computers used to be pretty slow, pretty limited. And what this meant was that programming languages really couldn't, in general, impose very much overhead. So I like to call these metal languages uh, because they were really close to the metal. So these in, you know, range from assembly language to Fortran to C and C++. But then, uh, and this is maybe like ancient history for some of you or before you were born, uh, but there was this period of time when computers just started getting faster and faster. Like every two years, they would be like twice as fast or more. Uh, and I contend this led to a period of irrational exuberance. Uh, where people just thought, hey, it doesn't matter how fat our computer programming languages are, it doesn't matter, right? So we could have languages whose only data type is a string, like tickle TK, or R, uh, which is, well, it's just a, a mess, but anyway. Um, or, or PHP, which required, you know, a thousand of engineering years to make reasonably performant. Um, there's Ruby, and then finally Python. And Python is the subject of this talk. All these languages really share a lot of common characteristics, but I'm going to be focusing on Python. So uh, Python, uh, like a Homer, is a little um, plump. Um, uh, it may surprise you to know just how plump Python is. Uh, so um, for example, in C or C++, the size of an int is unsurprisingly four bytes. But guess how big it is in Python? It's 28 bytes, all right? Uh, and, it, you know, why is it 28 bytes? Well, uh, you know, in every single object in Python, you've got a type tag, you've got a reference count, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a JPEG of Homer Simpson, who knows, right? It's an enormous amount of space. Uh, the same is true for everything. Uh, containers go from 24 bytes to 56 bytes, or 24 bytes to 64 bytes, depending. I should add, this is a huge improvement. Uh, it, as of version 3.6, uh, it was actually 240 bytes uh, for an empty uh, set, or dict, uh, and that is coincidentally how much Homer weighs, so perfect for this talk. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so most of you probably are familiar, maybe less familiar with the, uh, the bloat, but definitely familiar with this other aspect of Python, which is it is not famously fast. Uh, so here is a toy example. Uh, if you implement a pure matrix matrix multiply in Python, and you compare it to its highly optimized C counterpart, uh, the Python version runs approximately 60,000 times slower, uh, which is a lot. Okay, great. Uh, so you all might be thinking, oh, Python, we you know, don't use Python. Um, well, too late for that, uh, right? So Python is pretty much taken over. Uh, so on Tyobi has it as number one. Uh, Stack Overflow does this big developer survey. It's number three across all respondents, where HTML is number two. Uh, and uh, number one is Python, all right? So we're all kind of stuck in this stranglehold of Python performance. So you, know, you write a program in Python, fine, now you're stuck with it, and you have to make it run faster. What do you do? So you might consider turning to a profiler. So here is a profiler. Uh, this is the output of C profile, which is the, uh, the standard Python profiler. Um, it's really not the best. Uh, if you look closely, it actually tells you that it's spending all of its time in main, uh, which, uh, okay, good, true, uh, but, you know, maybe not very useful, all right? So the key insight, really, though, if you want performant Python, is kind of a Fight Club insight. Uh, so the, for those of you who haven't seen the, uh, the movie, I apologize, but, you know, first rule of Python programming is don't pi program in Python. All right, what you really want to do is you want to take advantage of part of the reason why everybody programs in Python, which is because there's this vast array of libraries written in C. These include things like NumPy, Scikit, TensorFlow. All right, uh, these are highly optimized. If you spend your time when you're writing Python actually running that code, it'll perform very well. So that's really what our profiler Scalene helps you do. 
Uh, I'm going to dive in a little bit and show you uh, Scalene in action. So here's a little bit of code that was contributed by a Scalene user. I'm going to go over it in a little more detail. Don't worry about what you see right now. Uh, this is the view you get from Scalene. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of these displays. All right? So on the far left, uh, it shows you the, uh, the CPU time that was consumed. Uh, and it breaks it down into whether you spent that time in the Python interpreter or running native code or in systems, uh, you know, running, like being blocked in the system, like an I.O. Um, it shows you how much memory is consumed. It also breaks that down between bloated Python memory and, you know, comparatively slender native memory. Um, so this helps highlight problems where you're not doing what you want and getting all of your code running in, in native land. Um, it also tracks uh, memory usage over time, so you can actually observe memory consumption, not o just with respect to specific lines, but also globally for the whole program. Um, it, it does a couple things I'm not going to have time to spend too much uh, on, but uh, it, it tracks a new metric we call copy volume. Copy volume is especially interesting in the, concept, uh, the context of Python because uh, if you have uh, a native object, you may accidentally coerce it back into Python land. So in the worst case, this could be basically taking a gigantic matrix of floats and converting it into a Python matrix of giant fat floats and then converting it back, which is invisible but catastrophic to performance. Um, and finally, this wasn't run on a GPU, but had it been, it would have shown utilization and percentage and peak memory on the GPU. So let's zoom in uh, so you can get a sense of how you can use scaling to optimize your code. Um, so here you can see, so dark is, uh, is actually bad and light is good in, this, uh, in these images. So you can see that it's spending a bunch of time, but most of it is in native code. And as I said, oh, native code is good, right? So that seems fine. Um, it's allocating two gigs, but it's two gigs of the good memory, the slender memory, so it seems OK. Um, it is really allocating memory like crazy, and it's doing this sawtooth. So it's allocating and freeing, allocating and freeing, allocating and freeing. That's odd. Um, and there's a bunch of copying happening. So lots of memory per second is being moved uh, via copying. That seems bad. So we look at the code, uh, and uh, this is some real code that uh, got sent to us. And uh, I don't know how many of you all are familiar with NumPy, uh, but NumPy has this thing, np.array, which converts Python arrays into NumPy arrays. Well, it'll also convert NumPy arrays into NumPy arrays. Uh, and this is already a NumPy array. And guess what it does? It just makes a brand new array and copies the old array into the new array. That's its default behavior. So obviously, we don't need to do that. So if we just optimize this code, by removing the np.array call, uh, we get a big change in how much memory is being consumed and a change in how much time is spent. So we went from 30 seconds to 23 seconds, and we went from, I think, uh, two and a half or three gigs to 1.6 gigs. So uh, not bad for a day's work. All right, so uh, beyond all of this about uh, Scalene and all the things that it shows you, it's also reasonably performant. Why does this matter? Uh, so if you have code that's slow, and you're running a profiler, and it makes that code run slower, uh, this compound effect can be painful. Uh, so in one of these cases, you can see that it's a 35x slowdown. These only do, all these things I've listed are some CPU profilers for Python. Um, of course, Python does CPU profiling, GPU profiling, and memory profiling. There is a memory profiler called memory profiler. Uh, no lack of creativity there. Um, and if you run this particular piece of code with memory profiler, it goes from taking five seconds to taking 20 minutes. So this is pretty painful, all right? So, uh, and scaling, like I mentioned, uh, provides this information at almost no cost. So um, I don't have too much time to get into the nitty gritty and details of how scaling works. I'm going to focus on two things. One, how it teases apart native time from Python time, and the other, how it accomplishes this low overhead memory profiling. All right. So, uh, Scalene, like uh, other fast profilers, is a sampling-based profiler. Uh, and if you're not familiar with how these work, in short, the way it works is you have periodic timing interrupts. Uh, and when the interrupt happens, you take a look and you say, hey, what's running right now? So I'm running function foo. And you say, oh, well, how much time are you running in function foo? I add it to the counter. Right? And the same, then I do this, I wake up again, uh, and it says, oh, I'm in bar. So I increment the bar count. I wake up again, it's in bar. I wake up again, I'm in foo. All right? So this seems fine. Unfortunately, uh, Python does something a little nasty with signals, which actually makes a lot of sense 
for the interpreter, which is that uh, it actually hijacks all signals. So you can send a Python process a signal. Uh, the Python process will handle all the signals itself and then eventually dispatch them to the actual Python code. All right? So that may seem OK, uh, but it turns out that this leads to a very weird situation. So when does it deliver these things? It delivers these signals after it's done executing an opcode in Python. All right? So if it was executing foo and then bar happened to be written in native code, well, while it's executing that code, no signals are delivered at all. So this thing could take 10 minutes. From the perspective of Python, no time has elapsed. All right? So this is clearly a problem, right? We want, obviously, to keep track of how much time native code is spending. Um, and uh, you know, in a sense, you know, Python is comatose during this period of time. Um, so we can't really rely on this. Uh, somewhat hilariously, there is a profiler called pprofile that actually does rely on this technique. Uh, and indeed, it has exactly this effect. So you run some giant chunk of native code, and it's like, nothing happened, uh, which is obviously undesirable. Um, so we're going to turn lemons into lemonade here. Uh, it turns out that you can um, actually remarkably easily infer execution time and get more information out than what you started with. So what we do is every time we get a signal, we also record the current virtual time. All right? And then we uh, make this very simple observation. Uh, if we observe a delay, well, that delay is really due to some native code being executed. We know what the original sampling interval was, and whatever the extra delay is, we can attribute to the running C code. And so this allows us not only to recover information about the, the code that's running, like bar and so on, it actually lets us do this at a line granularity. And so this is part of what allows us to tease apart Python from native code. Uh, we do the similar sort of trick to be able to extract system time. All right? So uh, I mentioned how memory profiler is 300x slower. Uh, why is it so slow? Well, it tracks every single malloc and free, and it makes a system call for every single malloc and free. Uh, you know how malloc and free, you want to issue a system call every time. Uh, you really don't. It does it literally all the time, uh, and that explains why it's slow. So in Scalene, we introduced a new thing that we call threshold-based sampling. And the idea for threshold-based sampling is you don't do anything until you cross a delta of like one megabyte. And when you do that, then you reset. And so you're always just going up and down. But when you're going up and down and you don't actually cross one of these thresholds, there's no cost. All right? So this gives you this actually higher accuracy than the memory profiler approach, because the memory profiler approach measures RSS instead of memory allocated. Uh, and it does it with little overhead. All right, so um, we've released Scalene as an open source project. It's become pretty popular. Um, a number of people have used it to successfully optimize their code, uh, leveraging Scalene's uh, specific characteristics to get significant speed ups. There's a number of these discussed in the paper. I'm just going to mention one. Uh, the folks at Semantic Scholar used it to reduce their costs by 92%, uh, which is the most is 100%, so 92 is pretty good. All right. Um, so I, I do want to say something uh, a little bit unorthodox. So I'm going to talk about some stuff that's not in the paper. So uh, we developed this new feature uh, after we wrote the paper. So you know, writing your code in Python may be not the best move, but it is what it is. We said you know, profiling your code with uh, Scalene is better. But even better is getting Scalene to optimize your code for you. Uh, and so now uh, Scalene incorporates, it's actually the first profiler to incorporate large language models. Uh, and you can open up this little, uh, this little tab for advanced options. You bring your own OpenAI API code. Uh, and you can click on an explosion to get an optimization for a region, a lightning bolt for a single line. Uh, here is the proposed optimization from the previous uh, code example, which actually runs faster. Uh, and here is an optimization uh, that, uh, that Scalene came up with using the large language models. Uh, can come up with some pretty sophisticated optimizations that have dramatic impacts. So uh, to conclude, Scalene provides lots of useful information to help guide Python programmers to optimize their code, now including AI optimization suggestions. Thanks for your attention.